this is Tony for A Minute to Midnight and we're welcoming back Laura Maxwell from Glasgow, Scotland. I presume you pronounce it Glasgow, not Glasgow. Uh, there, Laura, welcome. Yeah, Glasgow. Yeah, thanks, Tony. It's really good of you to have me back on. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's great, great to um, have you in again. And today I believe we're really going to be discussing topics like angels and deceptions and things around about that. So I'll let you um, begin with what you want to share. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, I guess, I suppose if I, if I was to give this a title, I guess I might call it something like Pentecostal spiritualism. Um I do consider myself a, of the Pentecostal denomination, so I'm not bashing Pentecostals at all. It's just that I've saw um, some some errors creeping in, um, and yet really, really kind of about the the area of so-called ghosts and uh, talking to angels, and also your um, recent guest, Carolyn Hamlet, ex Illuminati member, our mutual friend. She often teaches about just the, the, the old cult and um, all part of the Luciferian plan that that is in society now, including the church. So it, it's something that um, has always happened all, all through the Bible, of course, Old Testament and New, God's people have always um, incorporated some old cult practices and beliefs. So it's certainly not new. There is nothing new under the sun um, at all, but um, w when it does happen, it obviously it can be be concerning. So I'd just like to kind of share a little about that, and I guess as as well a, a little um, emphasis here that that w when we are sharing these things, we we, we love and we trust and we honour everyone. We we trust and we honour um, our leaders. We respect our leaders and friends my brothers and sisters in the Pentecostal denomination and others. Uh, so I'm not in any way saying any of this out of any type of malice. Um, but we all, um, you know, can have correction sometimes. None of us are, are above correction. And as we know that, that Paul, he often in his letters to the churches had to bring a little bit of correction now and then. Um, and also just the, the, the importance of God's grace which is, is, is crucial because all of us mess up. None of us are, you know, totally free of deception. Um, God's, God's grace covers us. We're imperfect people. And yet it's amazing he still uses us. So this isn't um, pointing the finger. And certainly myself, if, if I'm in any kind of error, then I would love it if my brothers and sisters approached me in love and, um, and that's, you know, yeah, that's challenged great. me. Yeah, because a lot of people don't. They, you know, they're so convinced that they're right and their doctrine is correct, uh, that they're almost the final authority on what's truth and what's error, and they won't look at it themselves. So I, I see it as a real strength when people have that attitude, where they can go, "All oh, right, correct me if I'm wrong," and I'm open to. You know, we're all on a path. We're growing, aren't we? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I've been, you know, a Christian now twenty years, and my ideas over the years have changed from when I first got saved. So, yeah, we are on a growth um, process and the Lord's always cleaning us up and correcting us when we're wrong and, yeah, just growing in him. So, really, what, what I've noticed, as I say, I've been 20 years born again and, and what I've noticed, um, particularly, I suppose you could say, yes, this is in the, the healing and deliverance ministries, the prophetic ministries, where this tends to happen more. Um, and I, I guess it's just because um, these guys are more open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural, the miraculous. So I guess if, if you're a Christian like that, you could you could say you're a bit more prone to deception. Certainly that's what my leaders have told me, and I've heard down through history that that tends to be the case. So ministries, for example, that do wonderful awesome ministry um, setting people free from curses um, demons spirits of infirmity, addictions freemasonry, all of that which is such a valuable and needed ministry and yet they can have a little bit of this deception 
um, popping in. I'd just like to, to cover tonight. So what is it I'm going to mention? Well, it, it's the whole kind of a, a area of the first topic is about where deliverance ministries feel they are releasing ghosts or earthbound spirits um, from the earth onto, onto Jesus and also um, casting ghosts out of people. So we've certainly heard of Christians casting demons out of people, but there are some deliverance ministries who also feel they are casting ghosts out of people. Um, so I'd like to kind of mention that. And also the area of shadow people as well, where they consider a demon, a ghost, and a shadow person as being three different types of entities. Whereas I would argue in actual fact that, that, that this is a deception and that these um, entities are one and the same. Like the Bible says they are, uh, they are demons masquerading as if, masquerading as if angels of light, as yes. if ghosts, yes. as if, yep. as if uh, dead people. Um, so really it's, it's like the, the paranormal um, type of belief system has crept, crept in here. Uh, and also, I would say, with all of these entities, if there is a deliverance minister listening who who is doing these things, please test test these spirits in Jesus' name, and you'll see its true identity. Um, I often say that. And the second area is the whole area of communicating with angels. Now that that we're seeing more uh, within Christian churches, and very akin to the New Age angel workshop type idea and I'll go on to, to say why I why I personally feel um why that why I feel that's the case. And really if to, to backtrack just a little bit in case people don't don't know me and, and wonder where I'm coming from. Um I got saved out of the New Age spiritualist movement 20 years ago. Um and I've been in ministry for for, for a few years. Uh, and one of the prophecies that sometimes people give to me, people who don't know me as well, which is interesting, is that part of my ministry not only is to, um, you know, see people saved out of the old cult, saved out of the new age, saved out of all these spiritualities and false gods, but also just to bring a little bit of gentle correction to prophetic and deliverance ministries. Um, so I'm still I'm in I'm in within my remit by sharing this if that makes sense um, that God's asked me to do and one time just about three years ago someone did prophesy that to me and it was very interesting because I literally sat down at a conference five minutes later and a deliverance minister sat beside me and he was a Pentecostal guy who believed he was sending ghosts onto Jesus so. I just heard that prophecy, you know, <laughs> again, and I shared with him um, my views on it all and, and from scripture, and he's, he, he hadn't heard it before. Um, so I guess his, his Christian friends thought this was, you know, credible ministry too. And he then said to me, yeah, I'll go away and pray about that and look more into that. So, yes, yeah, some people have listened, some people don't. That's, that's the nature of it, isn't it? Yeah. So that's just a little background. Mm. But really, you know, sorry. Yeah, Tony, I was just yeah. going to say, yeah, Second Corinthians eleven fourteen, where it talks about Satan appearing as an angel of light. I mean, he's the master deceiver, and if he mm -hmm. can get people to follow any sort of false doctrine, so he can continue to hide in the shadows, and his workers, you know, masquerading as angels of light, can bring deception. Then that's a big part of the the plan, I, I think. Uh, yeah, definitely, and um, you know, we, as I say, we see it all through the Bible. It's it's not new. It's um, something that does happen. It doesn't mean the Christian is a terrible bad Christian. <laughs> yeah, we, we're all open to to deception, and that's why we need each other, really, in the bod body of Christ. Um, so again, some people say, well, might say, does it really matter, Laura? You know, isn't it just a doctrinal difference or? you know, a difference in theology or um, interpretation of the Bible, definitely. And I would say, well, not really, because in actual fact, these are entities we're dealing with. These are demons. So 
if you're dealing with, with demons without realising it, you're actually, well, for a start, you, you're causing others to stumble. Um, it, it brings spiritual corruption and you're desecrating your own temple because if you do anything that, that's akin to the occult, you know, you're, you're, you're under demonic oppression yourself. Deuteronomy 18 talks about that, that, that these things are an abomination to God. Um, not because God's a, a killjoy and doesn't want you having fun or something like that. It's simply because he knows these are demon entities and he doesn't want you being cursed by them. He doesn't want you being defiled by them um, or them affecting your family. You know, and it's like in the book of Revelation that the message to the churches, um, as you know, talks about if we tolerate false teaching, it's not really God's will. It's, it's hard to, to speak out um, about false teaching. It, it, it is hard, but it's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to tolerate yeah. false teaching. Yes. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and because every, every because um, I'm a Pentecostal, I would class myself as Pentecostal as well, but and I believe in the genuine gifts, you know, that they're all still in operation today, speaking in tongues and prophesying and casting out demons and all of that sort of thing. Um, yeah. But for every genuine, genuine gift, Satan has a counterfeit. You know, you just uh -huh. look, you look at Christians, we have a, um, a crucifix or a cross. We don't worship the cross or the crucifix, but, you know, we use it as a symbol. And what do occultists do like luciferians and satanists they turn the cross upside down so it's mm -hmm. a counterfeit it's a back to front so if there's something genuine in christianity it it makes sense to me that satan is going to try and counterfeit it and twist it absolutely yeah i would agree with you and um i think also what i'm sharing i've, I've got friends in the ministry worldwide who are noticing these things too. For example, a friend, a friend of mine, Michael Cummings from Revelation TV, he is a deliverance minister, and yet he saw this creeping into uh, deliverance ministries around the world as well. He's aware of it in London. Um, so, yeah, it, it is something that, that seems to be on the rise, and discernment is, is, is needed, but the Bible too, it's, it's getting back to the Bible, and what does the Bible say about these things so a, a couple of little scriptures Hosea 4 6 my people perish through lack of knowledge and uh, Mark 13 21 talks about false signs and miracles performed to deceive even God's people 1 Timothy 4 in the last days some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and doctrines taught by demons so I think as well you know a good place to start is how are these teachings in relation to the cross? Um, and I think really, because they're not a little side issue, you know, you'll have friends who say, well, within Christian um, churches, you can eat eat the meat and, and stick, you know, spit out the bones. If it's just a little, a little error, you, you let it go. I understand that. But if it's an issue that's central to the message of the cross and salvation, then um, I don't think it's something we can actually ignore. Um, so I think that's kind of worth worth mentioning. So really, because it is getting into the realm of the occult, it is dangerous, spiritually speaking. So to backtrack again to a few years ago, um, within one week, I literally heard of about three or four different people all tell me the same kind of reports about this so-called um, deliverance ministries releasing ghosts. And never in my 15 years before that had I ever heard that. So it was quite a shock. It all came at once. Plus that week I was even reading about it myself in a deliverance book. And I even heard about it on some deliverance CDs that this was a teaching within deliverance ministries. So it really seemed within that week the Lord was pinpointing me to this area to reveal it to me. And um, I, also, I also heard from two ex-spiritualists who had been to um, a deliverance conference and saw the same practice um, endorsed there. So it also takes me to my own experience of it. Obviously, I'm a Pentecostal, so I go to conferences 
regarding healing, deliverance, uh, gifts of the spirit. And I once was at a conference where it was actually a, a great conference. Um, the guy was doing Freemasonry deliverance, which was fantastic. And my grandfather had been a Freemason, so I did actually get Freemason demons cast out me. Hallelujah, I'm, I'm grateful to the man for that. Um, however, when he heard, he asked my background and heard I'd been a spiritualist, he tried to cast human spirits out of me um, that were my ancestors all down through the generations. Now, I thought, well, why would all my human ancestors, all the dead spirits, jump into my body? I've got cousins, I've got other family members. Why are they all in me anyway? Didn't quite see the logic. Plus, um, he felt spirits of mediums all down the generations too, down my mum's side, down my dad's side. So again, I thought, okay, if you go back to at least the book of uh, Leviticus, where spiritualism is mentioned, all these dead mediums and relatives are meant to be in me. Well, I think I would be worse state than the demoniac in Mark 5 who had a legion. <laughs> you know, yeah. literally thousands upon thousands of, of dead family members and dead mediums were meant to be in me. And I thought, gosh, you know, I don't think there'd be any space for any demons <laughs> to be cast out of me as well, you know. Um, yeah, that's that's completely wrong. I mean, dead spirits can't inhabit a person. That is really getting into the whole spiritualist philosophy that thinks that they're floating around. I mean, they're mm -hmm. either they're either one place or the other. They're either you know in a holding place f before the lake of fire, or they're in heaven. As far as I'm concerned, I don't see any room for them floating around in this earth. I think as well it just shows you the syncretism that does occur and the fact that these kind of uh, ideas and practices are uh, in certain forms of witchcraft or occult. Um, but basically, to, to look at the Bible, does it mention this? No. You know, Jesus and the disciples, they cast demons out of people. Exactly. They, they didn't cast people out of people. No. Or uh, ghosts no. out of people. Um, so... Also, just within that as well, having been to meetings or heard about meetings where um, they would say that children of a previous revival or ministers of a previous revival of hundreds of years ago have turned up in the room to come and bring a prophecy or come and bring healing um, to the congregation. Now, to me, that just smacks of spiritualism because... God can send us a message or a prophecy, yes, but you know, through the Holy Spirit or through an angel, not through dead people who who were here hundreds of years ago. And um, one such meeting where a leader was talking about this, he actually said, when he was at this meeting where it happened, he even admitted that he felt the atmosphere felt really eerie. So why would it feel eerie, eerie if it's something of God? And he was the leader himself who had been there. And really, it's, you know, dead people don't come back. This is the whole crux of when I share my own testimony coming out of spiritualism. The Bible shows they don't come back. It's all demonic impersonators. Hebrews 9.27, people are destined to die once and then the judgment. They're not, they don't come back. Um, and neither are they trapped, earthbound spirits. And um, I'd like to refer people to an excellent example of this, and it's a good friend of mine, Mark Hunneman, who wrote a book, Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. It's the best book I've read so far on this very topic. And in fact, I, I interviewed him on my radio show once um, about this. That's on my YouTube channel. And he's really an expert on the Christian analysis, analysis of this whole ghost topic. Um, so again, backtracking to examples of, of Christians I've heard of who do this, there was a, a woman who said dead people come to her uh, needing her help to pass over. So again, I would question that and say, well, well, how did they find her? If they could find her, why couldn't they find their way to Jesus? You know, whether you might say, well, I don't know, is it a portal that, that, that you go up or does an angel come and get you, whatever. 
if they managed to find her, how did they manage to lose their way upon death, um, the moment of death? And why appear at her house anyway? Why not go to her church or her Bible study group? Because surely if the more Christians there, the more could help. And I would say, well, the reason they didn't appear in her church was because they knew the other Christians would discern it's a deceiving demon and cast it out. And also, if it was true, um, these trapped human beings, these ghosts, they would appear at Christian homes and churches all the time looking for help to find Jesus. Um, so, and even the very act of her talking to these so-called ghosts, talking to them long enough to release them, as it were, that is still coming under what the Bible says, attempting to contact the dead. It, so it's still coming under that whole realm of um, an area with, which God doesn't want people to do simply because he knows it as demons and not the dead. Yeah, yeah um, I agree completely. And similarly, people, there's um, Christian ministers who feel they, these ghosts um, who are perhaps hanging around a graveyard or um, a war zone or a, you know, a death camp like Auschwitz, and they'll say things like the reason why the ghosts are trapped there is because they didn't have a funeral or because it was a traumatic death or they've got unfinished business. Just different reasons for why they say this happens. Um, but I would say, well, that's not what the Bible says. It says when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I mean, in, in my teenage years, I kind of went through a lot of that same sort of thing. Um, so it's bringing back a lot of memories for me of having those similar sort of beliefs that were halfway between Christianity and the occult, you know, confused beliefs. And all they did was put me under s severe attack, which I won't go into in the uh -huh. show. But, you know, it, w it was way off track. Um, and it does yep. need to be addressed and corrected. What what about um, the angels and angelic orbs? You know, that's another thing that seems to be creeping in, I, I notice, you know. Um, yeah, even amongst yeah. churches, it's like, well, wait a second, this orbs, that, you know. That That's the bit I'll come to when I get on to that uh, section. Okay. Definitely. So just remind me, please, <laughs> yep. when, I, when I get to that bit. Um also, just as I said, you know, my friend Michael, who's from Revelation TV, he sees this a lot and he's heard of Christians doing these things. He um, said, you know, there's the overlap there with some African witchcraft beliefs, like when a woman's baby dies in her womb, they, they feel that the baby's dead soul is trapped in the womb and needs released. Well, there are some deliverance ministers who are doing that, um, when in actual fact we would say well it's um it's it's not the dead baby it's just obviously a spirit of of death or, or abortion or whatever that is in the womb that's causing her health problems so that michael met a woman she was 60 and she he got a word of knowledge from the lord that she'd had an abortion at 19 and that ever since there was this uh demon there pretending to be her dead baby and literally he cast it out you know, mm. and it wasn't a dead baby. It literally yeah. was, it literally was a demon. So just a little practical example there, um, and also within this kind of area, there's there's people who I heard a one Pentecostal woman who feels that she 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 doesn't do this anymore because I spoke to her and and, and thank God she um, the Holy Spirit showed her the truth. But for some time she had been having visions where she thought she was going to hell and speaking to people in hell and getting them born again. And she'd read books on Catholic books on purgatory and the like. And so to her, it felt a unique, special ministry. But again, you know, did Jesus tell us to do that? No. Jesus or the disciples didn't do that. And I guess it goes back to the centrality of the cross again. Jesus Christ's death on the cross was enough. Um. He said it is finished. He didn't say it is finished, but you might need to go to purgatory. Um, no. And when we, you know, when, when we die, either you could say an, an angel takes us straight to the Lord's presence or a spirit of death takes us straight to hell 
whatever way you want to describe that. And I imagine there's maybe some type of, you know, portal type experience happens there. But so why would you get why would you get lost, become an earthbound spirit? Why would you need uh, to be saved out of purgatory? That makes a mockery of the cross. It does. I would yeah. say. Um, and I don't, when it's someone's time and you die, I, you know, I pretty much feel that the second you die, you go to your destination. I don't think you can hide from an angel um, and get lost. No. You know, so, no. And, and Jacob, Jacob talks about how he saw a ladder that went into heaven. I think it also implies that if, if you die and um, become an earthbound ghost, somehow God is incapable of sending you to your destination. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't think so. I think the whole, that's another thing is portals. And um, I've heard people even referring to that in Christian circles, you know, kind of. It's like, oh, you know, I start thinking you, we've got to be real careful on that because um, the the demon, the demonic, the occult, they're looking at all these portals as places to bring spirits through. So why do we as Christians need to, to be worrying about angels coming through portals and different things like that? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's a, another, it's a distraction. Yeah, I think it's a distraction too. And, and I think that, you know, even if that is the way God has um, organized things to happen, it doesn't tell us that in the Bible. He doesn't tell us to be concerned um, no. or um, interested in these in these types of things. No, because, I mean, to me it's like you wouldn't get angels and demons coming through the same portals. So, w you know, we know the occult, um, they're looking for portals and, Oh, the whole thing with CERN and, and everything, with the whole portals thing, I just don't think as Christians we should be looking uh, looking for, well, any sort of contact with portals anyway. So that's a little bit of a, a distraction and a side issue, but I, I just get concerned when I hear people from a pulpit talking about portals because mm -hmm. it's like you're just borrowing from the language, of, you know, that the... Um, the the occultists are using at this point. Yeah, I think so because, you know, look at what Jesus said and what was part of the Great Commission and what did he teach the disciples to do and what did he say that we were to do? Um, preach the gospel, you know, feed, feed the poor, heal the sick, cast out demons, prophesy, signs and wonders and miracles. There wasn't all these kind of extra bits added on, which I think are the distraction. Once you get into all that, it could be taking you away from your real ministry and, and calling in God that he really wants you to, to focus on. Um, and yet you can see how even with tradition and going back through history, how this mix of ideas has come from. For example, uh, purgatory, partly from the Romans, where they would put coins on eyelids of the dead to pay the boatman to take them to Hades. Uh, um, yeah. You know, that kind of continued right up to times of Victorian Britain. So although that was just a tradition, traditions can last and they can become embedded in doctrine and people can forget what is tradition and what is real real doctrine. Yeah. Um, okay, so... And the same... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, as, as time is sort of marching on, um, you were going to talk about angels as well, and you know the whole thing. I think there's a yeah a growing overemphasis on it. I mean, we we know that angels are ministering spirits and messengers, and and all throughout the Bible we see them being sent to do things and to um, to bring protection and to bring guidance and bring messages, but. I notice, I can't think of, I don't know, perhaps I'm wrong, but I can't think of any cases where the people actually sought out the angels. It was the other way around. The angels were sent to them. They didn't go uh -huh. looking for the angels. And, you know, like I've heard people talking about angels tickling them and all sorts of things, and it's and this is in Christianity, and I'm thinking that just, just that's really out in left field, and I don't, it, I'm mm -hmm. not at all comfortable with it. So I'd be really interested yeah. in your point on all of this. I would I agree with you there. And um, just to just to kind of finish up what I was saying about the 
so-called ghosts. You know, the thief on the cross, when he, when he was dying, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't mention you could get earthbound, you could get lost. Um, Hebrews 9.27, Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Therefore, a purgatory is not, is not needed. Basically, Christ's death on the cross was enough that people don't need to become earthbound. I agree. Um, so, yeah, definitely the, the angel workshop thing does does concern me. And, and like you say, for example, in, in Zechariah, the prophet, yeah, he did see an angel and he did see visions and he did speak to the angel, but that was a sovereign act of God. God sent the angel to him. Zechariah didn't just sit down and decide, uh, I think I'll... Um, pray here and uh, start talking to angels and, and, you know, invite them to come to me. So, yeah, it is a concern because this is um, merging in with uh, conferences to hear God's voice. Um, so maybe not in a literal sense of not calling up an angel. I don't mean it that way, but having a dialogue with an angel inside your mind's eye, similar to the, the visualization techniques that esoteric groups do use. And I, I think the thing that really the alarm bells ring when you hear um, these folks encouraging the, the people to try this exercise often or try this exercise daily, sit down, ask your angel to appear, to come through the door, to talk to you, um, ask it what it's doing today, ask it its function, etc., I just feel, you know, that's like elevating angels to the place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that we should be talking to daily, not seeking to communicate with angels. And, and also in that area where, yeah, like you say, angels tickling them or angels turning up to have a tea party with you or angels turning up and moving your coffee cup around the house. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not consistent with the Bible because I'm not saying angels can't turn up. But test the spirits. Do Did they act like that in the Bible? No, they normally came when it was a very important message they had to give. Yes. Very important message indeed. They didn't come just to have a bit of a, a, a tea party with you. And also, even the names some of these so-called angels are giving themselves. Um, you know, I've, I've heard of Pentecostal Christians who say, like, their angel's name is Candy Cane or a word like that. Right. Well, I don't, to me, that's just like Satan is just laughing yeah. at them because even New Age angels have got more sophisticated names than that. And again, is it consistent with the Bible? Is that how you see angels act in the Bible? And also test it in Jesus' name just because the experience is real and the experience feels good and even feels like the Holy Spirit. It can feel anointed, but test it in Jesus' name to reveal its true identity to you. I agree. And what about orbs? What do you what do you think, or what do you know about those? Well, again, I would say that that is just another um, infiltration of New Age belief and practice. Um, I'm not saying an angel cannot turn up, but it's not consistent with the biblical record. Um, so I would I would uh, question that. Um, and again, we say this in love because anybody can be deceived. Um, we're not, you know, we're not pointing, we're not pointing the finger in any way. And I think the thing about the angels is as well, would we really in an irreverent way with angels, you know, and, and laugh about with them? Because it's not what happened in the Bible. When an angel turned up in the Bible, it was a serious, you know, a significant event and they were... Um, the people responded to them with, with reverence. They didn't worship them, but they certainly didn't just... Um, it was just like a, a bit of a party they were having. No, I mean, it does say in Hebrews 13 too, be careful, uh, sorry, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So angels can obviously come and appear as humans, um, and we may not always know that they're angels, Um but we are also warned not to worship them, uh, like mm -hmm. Colossians 2.18 and Revelations 22.9 are both cases where we, we're told not to worship them. But, yeah, I, I guess it's if God's 
God chooses to send an angel to us and we see the angel and the angel speaks to us, um, it's it's not going to be, I, I just can't see it going to be to move a teacup around, like you say, or tickle you or, or play games. That just doesn't, there's just mm-hmm. absolutely nothing in the Bible that supports that as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, yeah. we've we've really got to be, be weary. And it's also, if anything, um, more akin to the way a so-called poltergeist would act yes. in actual fact, which, of course, is a demon yep. uh, anyway. But I, I think that the, the problem can be with, with um, lots of um, ministries is that, yes, because they're already a, a good ministry that is doing God's work and is moving in, in gifts of the Holy Spirit, they can feel that, well, I've already got the gift of discernment of spirits I already cast out demons therefore I'm discerning that this is true um or they may say well it's because the Holy Spirit showed me this is true and these are some deeper truths he's showing me that are not in the Bible these are some deeper truths that he has kept for ministries at the last days um he's now revealing to us but again I would say if that's the case, it should still be consistent with the Bible anyway um, and the nature of of how God operates within the Bible. It shouldn't be something, you know, entirely new, like angels suddenly start changing their character. Um, no. I, I don't think that's really biblical. No, I, I would agree with that. And, and very briefly then, um, it's kind of... Another thing that bothers me is a little bit, you know, the I, I like I said earlier, I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in speaking in tongues and healing and, and that people can genuinely get what we call slain in the Spirit and all that. But there's a lot of stuff that's gone on in Pentecostal so-called revivals in recent years that I really question, you know, like it just doesn't seem consistent with the Bible to me, you know. People acting like dogs or, you know, barking or writhing around like snakes or, you know, all this sort of stuff that's like, whoa, you know, and it's being accepted as a part of a move of God. And as I said earlier, I believe that Satan has a counterfeit for everything. And even in genuine moves of God and genuine revivals, there's going to be counterfeits yeah, as a distraction. Def- definitely. And yeah, even... Funnily enough, within the Pentecostal movement itself, if you look down through its history, there's often been some who have prophesied uh, that in the latter days things are going to creep into the movement that are from the Kundalini spirit or um, from from Satan. Some, you know, key prophets even did say that about our own about our own movement. So yeah, it's um, just just have to be be so careful, all of us, and, and weigh everything up. Wave if not with the Bible. Um, I, I would say, same, actually, yeah. if you could just, I mean, some people won't know what the Kundalini spirit is. Can you just very briefly describe it so p- people know where we're coming from? You know, what the Kundalini spirit is and why we're saying you've got to be careful um, that it's not creeping in? Well, there's a, a whole lot on that, and I'm not an expert on that, but I can certainly point you to people who are. Um, um, there's people like Johanna Michelson who was into the occult before she became a Christian um, and others who, people who know a lot about yoga um, who came out of that and, and see the, the similarities and at the end of the day the proof's in the pudding if you've been involved in any of these things as a Pentecostal if you, you go and receive deliverance um, and ask for you know certain demons to be cast out of you they will come out, and that is the proof that you've been involved in something um, that, that 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 has had the occult involved in it. For example, I know of people who, who do deliverance ministry and who did some of these things who then required ministry themselves to get the false, <laughs> the, the, you know, the falseness cast out of them because it does defile you when you're dealing with demons, thinking that they're ghosts or angels. It defiles you yourself, even if you are a deliverance minister. And I think that itself is is um, is the proof of the pudding too. Yes, yes, I would agree. And it, it, everything has to line up with scripture. Ultimately, that's got to be our yardstick, really, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay so um, yeah, that's great, Laura. Have you got any other sort of things you want to add before we closing? 
Um, just to repeat what I'd said earlier, if anyone wants to know a little bit about this in more detail, um, Mark Hunneman wrote a book titled Seeing Go Ghosts Through God's Eyes, and you can find my five-part radio show with him on my YouTube channel where he goes into this whole issue in more depth. And finally, to leave people um, on a note of encouragement and hope, Romans 2.4 says God's kindness leads people to repentance. So this message is not to condemn anyone at all. We've all been there. We all have, have know people who have been there. If you feel God is speaking to you about this, please come to him and let him uh, forgive you and cleanse you and set you free because when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. And my blog, if anyone's interested, is a spiritualquest.tk. Thank you, Laura. It's been great having you on again today, and um, I'm sure people will have got a bit of an eye-opener to some things here, and hopefully it gives them something to take away and think very carefully about, particularly if they're involved in any of those things. So thank you again for coming on to A Minute to Midnight today, Laura. Thanks so much, Tony. God bless. Bless you too. Off air after the interview, Laura asked me to remind listeners that there is a Luciferian New World Order agenda which seeks to bring in a one world religion and of course with it one world government and one world currency. That if all the churches start obeying these so-called angels and ghosts, one day these angels may announce that Jesus isn't coming back. It's the other Messiah. And churches will fall for it because they've been trusting these angels and ghosts for years. Or they'll tell churches to unite with other faiths or to come under the Pope or any number of unscriptural plans. Such angels are pretending to bring new revelation not mentioned in the scriptures. So yes, remember that that is the ultimate plan that they're trying to get everyone into eventually this one world religious system and that's what the New Age teaches, and it's what the uh, spirit guides, etc., are teaching. You'll hear more about that if you go back and listen to the other interview we did with Laura a few weeks ago. And don't forget to check out her website. Also, go to our website if you haven't been there, um, a minute to midnight.com. We are updating with um, all our videos go on there and audio versions of the interviews and also articles on various topics are posted on there regularly as well and also there's a donate button on there if you want to help us out to keep this program going that'd be great also i create all the music for our podcasts i write the music and play it and on the website we have a link to rockshawsounds.com if you um, support rockshawsounds.com by using production music or sound effects packs you also directly help support minutetomidnight.com okay so that's it for today and we will catch you hopefully in the next broadcast